Helena, welcome to studio. Thank you very much. As the internet has developed, we're seeing more interaction with people from different parts of the globe. And now we're seeing people also exchanging work and other services. What spurred this revolution? Well, it's been a slow revolution because when we first had the internet, it was the realization that we could communicate with people from elsewhere. And then there's been a realization, if we can communicate, why don't we take advantage of different and typically differently priced options across the world. So we saw that you had call centers in places like um, India. And so we, we would be based somewhere typically in the US, but we would have a call center somewhere. But it was at the level of an organization. As individuals are developing, are, are getting their own PCs and are getting internet access themselves, we're seeing now that the, re the revolution involves individuals. So as an, a freelancer, I can offer my jobs online for a buyer wherever in the world. And there's been a wide variety of platforms that have emerged to make it possible for individual buyers to find individual contractors, literally from across the globe. Now, your research, if we go back to Economics 101 of demand and supply, has highlighted that those economics don't per se hold, where someone in a developing country is earning much less than someone in a developed country. There are two reasons for it. The first thing is if we look at the activities that can be done on the internet, there are lots. Software development, developing a TV commercial, um, any activity that's not tied down to a specific place. But there are also fairly simple tasks like data entry or like um, maybe transcriptions. And, and on this continuum, what we see is that people from the less developed countries tend to, to do more of the less skilled work. Even if we hold constants, constant the type of work, so even if we look at, be it transcription or software development, and we look at two providers, the one is somebody in your own country, and the other one is a provider from another country, what we're seeing quite clearly is that you'll pay somebody in your own country more than somebody from another country. And unfortunately, the people doing the buyer tend to be the rich countries. So what this in effect means is if you're an Australian and you're buying certain services from an Australian, you will pay more than if you buy that same service from a South African, just because of the economics. Is it purely because of perceptions around the economics or is it also driven by local laws? What we saw is that if there's a local law playing in, you do find that foreigners are, are paid less, and, and quite substantially so. And this makes sense, because you need somebody to understand the local tax laws or employment laws. So in those categories, we do see that people from foreign countries are paid less. In academia, we talk about the liability of foreigners, literally that being a foreigner carries a liability. And we clearly see this. So, so the story that the internet has made the, the, the borders of the world disappear is not actually true. People behave on the internet in the same way that they behave in the real world. And on the internet, you trust somebody from your country whom you've never seen and probably will never see more than you trust somebody from another country. And what are the kind of mechanisms that are being employed to screen and vet some of the people that you're procuring services from? So one of the things that we're seeing is that people are having to make very tough choices because it's a, a little bit of a wild west out there. The, the space of doing work on the internet is not governed by the labor laws of any country. It's not governed by any form of organized labor action. So, so it's literally me as an individual, more or less savvy, contracting from you who's more or less savvy or trustworthy or, or whatever. And, and suddenly we find that the individuals who work in this space have to really be good at figuring out which jobs are legitimate jobs. Uh, how do I trust that an employer will, will actually pay me? If you do hourly work, it's very um, easy because there's an app that actually takes random screenshots of your screen and, um, and automatically, if, if those screenshots are accepted, you get paid. So, so there doesn't need to be an explicit agreement. But we really see the whole way that work is organized is having to be rethought.